Rusty froze in fear, anger, and disorientation. There was a smell that could turn his reality inside out, a mixture of burning hair, fuel, blood, and acid. The first time he encountered that smell was Blood River. He had encountered that strange mixture a handful of times since then, and every time it gave him a flashback. Flashbacks weren't like what you saw in entertainment vids. In those movies, the person experiencing a flashback would be caught in some sort of hallucination, completely unaware of where they actually were and what was going on around them. A flashback was more like having an extremely vivid nightmare that you were trying to wake up from, where you could see and hear where you actually were, but you felt as though you were back in the bad place where the bad things were happening. Rusty had heard that smells, he were the strongest triggers of flashbacks, and from his experience, that was absolutely true. The hallway of the ship Nogala was completely safe, and yet he still felt the rage and terror from Blood River. It was times like this, when he really understood why so many of his fellow veterans were substance addicts, and why he had left human territory never to return. Rusty had been a Terra Marine. Those who have never been in the Marines did not understand the saying, Once a Marine, always a Marine. But those who had become Terra Marines understood it all too well. It started in basic, where they would tear you down and build you back up. Every few decades, some psychologists would try to change this method. The other armed forces would give in to the current political pressure, but not Terra Marines. They had their ways and standards, and nothing would change that. Other services had non-negotiable entrance standards, but flexible performance standards. Terra Marines had almost no entrance standards, but performance standards were non-negotiable. Rusty's recruiter was about to deny enlistment to a candidate missing an arm, but Colonel Ibanez was there that day, touring recruitment offices. He took Rusty and the other candidate to a local shooting range, picked out weapons most similar to infantry issue, then proceeded to demonstrate and instruct them through the standard test that all infantry had to pass. The test included clearing jammed weapons and reloading, as well as accuracy on rapid fire. The one armed candidate realized his unfitness for duty and was visibly defeated. When they walked outside of the range, the colonel's vehicle was missing. As it turned out, the colonel had sent it back to the recruitment center so they could take the other half of the impromptu test, running the nine kilometers back to the station. Rusty had wondered why the colonel wore combat fatigues instead of the more formal dress uniform, and now he understood why. He was stunned that this man, easily old enough to be his father, outran both of the young men. When they got back to the recruitment center, the colonel handed the one armed candidate a business card. Hey, Baludo, just because you can't enlist doesn't mean you can't contribute. Go to Azteca Armas. Apply to the Special Weapons Development Team. We have Marines who lose limbs but not their experience. We need to develop prosthetics IOTRA tools so we can retain them. Attach this card to your application. Tell them Mori sent you. As the candidate walked away, the colonel mused. I hope they find a way to use him. I would want him in my unit if it were possible. He has gone us. When you were a Terra Marine, you stood taller, became focused, walked and talked differently. In basic training, they intentionally pushed you to your breaking point and beyond. They used a variety of psychological tortures, gaslighting, sleep deprivation, physical discomfort, to include heat and cold and itch, public humiliation, starvation, fear, anger, beatings, and frustration. At the time, it seemed like pointless sadism. At one point, Rusty and his squad, after failing to pass an obstacle course, again challenged their drill sergeant to make it pass the obstacle course. The sergeant gave them a wicked smile, made a quick call on his communicator, then mashed his company for the next 20 minutes. Mashing was high-intensity calisthenics, impossible exercises designed to cause every muscle of your body to scream in pain. 
His sergeant seemed particularly fond of team push-ups. A squad of four would stand in a square. When they went down to push-up positions, their feet, instead of resting on the ground, rested on each other's backs, so the men had to form a square. This caused full body weight to be only on your hands. When doing the exercise, all four members would have to raise and lower simultaneously, or else the square fell apart. During the mash, once a team reached 20 consecutive push-ups, they would be allowed to stand at parade rest for the rest of the mash. So far, none of the 20 squads had managed to accomplish it. At the end of the 20 minutes, two more companies had shown up. The drill sergeants explained that they were going to demonstrate a successful run of the course. Then each squad was going to have one opportunity to run the course. Any squad that failed was going to run until dinner. One recruit pointed out that they were missing a fourth man for their squad. Rusty's drill sergeant pointed and replied, He's on the way. Rusty looked and squinted. The running figure looked vaguely familiar to him. Then he realized where he recognized the runner from. The Marine coming towards them was actually a colonel, who had been touring recruiting offices when Rusty enlisted. Rusty remembered that the colonel, old enough to be his father, had easily outran him and another recruit in an impromptu fitness test. Rusty had a sense of how the day would go. Fuck! The colonel came inside the obstacle course yard, ran around the inside perimeter twice, once clockwise and once counterclockwise, then approached the companies. The sergeants saluted the colonel as he arrived, which he returned, then spoke. I hear you're going to show Los Muchachos how it is done. I couldn't let you take all the fun. Rusty's squad mate snickered looking at the colonel. Is he joking? That's somebody's grandpa. He's barely 1.5 meters tall. Rusty shook his head. Hold on to that thought. I met Colonel Ibanez at my recruiting station. He is no joke. His squad members just chuckled, but a recruit named Wheeler from a neighboring squad leaned over. Wait, did you say Ibanez? That's Maury. We are so screwed. The other recruits looked at him puzzled, while Wheeler continued. My uncle served under him. Once when his battalion was on the way to the front, he got bored in the Space Force transport ship, so he ordered the captain to go hunt pirates along the way. The captain tried to refuse, so he took command of the ship and went after the pirates. They captured pirate ships and dismantled them to scrap metal, then beat confessions out of the crews to get information. That's why there aren't any pirates in the Upsilon Omega sector anymore. He's a legend. The recruits murmured as the rumors quickly circulated through the gathering. The colonel spoke. We will demonstrate how to navigate this course. Then each of the four of us will choose three recruits and lead a team through the course. He paused, looking around. Mi esposa, an Earth Force nurse, has a saying. See one, do one, teach one. Today you will learn this. When your squad completes the course, the leader will go to rest and the other three will form a squad to teach others. If your squad fails, you will run outside the perimeter of the course. At the end of the lap, you will try again. You will continue, otra vez, otra vez, otra vez, until you succeed. Then the leader may rest and the others will go teach. Estadia, you have opportunity to learn leadership and teamwork. Make the most of it. The recruits watched the sergeants and colonel fly through the course in record time. Rusty noted how they worked in a completely integrated way, using teamwork and leveraging group weight to overcome obstacles. Rusty's mouth was actually hanging open as his brain disassembled the performances of the seasoned Marines and the recruit squads, realizing all the mistakes recruits had made. After the sergeants and colonel were done, they walked through the ranks, selecting members for their new squads. The colonel recognized Rusty. You, Hauser, we have met before, I remember. Venisaka. He waved Rusty over. I want two others, not from your squad. Any volunteers? Wheeler hesitantly raised his hand. Maury waved him over. He squinted at the recruit for a moment. Wheeler? You seem familiar. Do you have familia in the Marines? Wheeler nodded. Yes, sir. 
My uncle. He was in your unit about 12 years ago during the campaign in the Zeta Omega sector. Maury chuckled. Yes, Wheeler. Good man. It is because of him that we were able to stop those pirates. Wheeler stared at him in shock. Then the story is true? The colonel clapped him on the shoulder. See, you have legacy. I am confident that you will make him proud. After the fourth recruit joined them, the colonel had them walk the inside perimeter of the course, pointing out features and deliberate handholds and routes. Ibanez explained to them that he had run the two inside laps when he arrived in order to get a look at the course. The recruits were even more amazed. Rusty asked, Sir, how were you able to see all that while you were running? Colonel Ibanez answered, I did not at the time. However, I know that your sergentos are quite familiar with this course. That is why I followed their lead. The recruit's eyes widened. He continued. Leadership is not just giving orders. Anyone can do that, even bossy small children. Leadership is making the best team and accomplishing the mission. True leaders serve their men by doing what is best for them and the mission. The colonel's squad finished the course the first time through. After, the three recruits went to choose squads. Rusty and Wheeler both walked their way through the course with their squads, then successively completed it first time through. The third recruit skipped the walkthrough, so his squad had to run. On their second try, the third recruit walked his squad through first. Then they were able to complete the course on the next try. Some recruits, noting the success, began walking the course before being selected for squads. At the end of his squad's successful run-through, Rusty was bent over panting to catch his breath. When he straightened, instead of going over to the rest area, he went to where recruits were waiting to try the course. The colonel joined him on the way. Where are you going, Hauser? Rusty replied. To get another squad, sir. Since I know the course, I can lead them through. The colonel gave a small smile. Porque you could rest instead. Rusty cupped his crotch for a moment. Because I have ganas. Colonel Ibanez burst out out laughing. Obviously you speak no Spanish at all besides the menu at Don Perito. He pointed to Rusty's groin. Those are huevos. Ganas is desire, fire in the heart. See, si, you have ganas. Rusty had spent the rest of the day leading more squads through the course. Wheeler spent most of the day at the rest area, passing gossip stories about the legendary Mori. That was the day that Rusty felt like he actually became a Marine. He had even go so far as to join the Templars, a religious group that was dedicated to God through military service. He became an initiate, eagerly awaiting his first battle so he could become a knight. He had served in a couple units under Mori's command, participating in minor skirmishes against hostile aliens. Then he was assigned to a task force that was dealing with domestic terrorists. These terrorists were fanatics, attacking civilians, taking hostages, and using hostages and civilians as human shields. Attempts at negotiations had been unsuccessful since terrorists would only accept unconditional surrender and demanded annexation of regions to their authority. Regular Earth Force soldiers were at a complete stalemate against the terrorists, so the Terra Marines were called in. The SAIG had been going on for months with constant civilian and hostage casualties. The Marines' orders were clear. The situation was to be resolved by any means necessary in ten days. If there was any resistance left, then all enemy-controlled areas would be glassed, regardless of civilians or hostages present. Rusty S. Platoon was pinned down by enemy fire coming from a school. Rusty and three others formed a squad, using cover fire from the rest of the platoon to sneak over to the school. Using their power armor, they climbed up the building, launched explosives into the classrooms where terrorists were shooting out of, and then burst in like furies of vengeance from ancient legends. When Rusty burst through the window into a classroom, that was when he smelled it. Death. The fuel and acid were from supplies in the classroom. This had been a chemistry classroom where students had used burners and acid to learn about the composition of matter. 
The burning hair was from terrorists who had been incinerated by the blast, but the blood that came from the children who had been held in an adjacent the room by the terrorists in order to be human shields against retaliation. The Marines were sickened and outraged as they saw knife wounds on the children, realizing that the terrorists had killed the children before the firefight. Earth Force medics were immediately summoned, but it was already too late, as dozens, even hundreds of corpses of hostages and civilians were recovered and moved. The streets often had rivulets of blood flowing. A news reporter made a comment about rivers of blood in the streets, so the place quickly became known as Blood River. Due to risk of disease, the people were cataloged and identified as quickly as possible, then bodies sent to be incinerated. The horrid smell came again. For days and days, Rusty had gone numb completely numb. He became a machine, just part of his power armor. His voice and eyes were dead flat. He took on consecutive missions, surviving impossible odds and doing impossible feats. He was praised for his bravery and given medals, but he didn't care about any of it. He was hollow, empty. He quickly started to hate the medal ceremonies. How ridiculous was it to give tacky trinkets when there was so much death? After the Blood River campaign, Rusty had served on a minor peacekeeping mission on an alien border. Fortunately, the locals had heard about Blood River and were completely terrified of humans. If they were willing to do those things to their own kind, then not even the gods could protect them from humans. Because the mere sight of Earth Force personnel was enough to quell any threat, the assigned Marines were left with not much to do. Rusty was guarding a supply depot. He was watching the power loaders move cargo and supplies and noted the similarities between the loaders and Terra Marine power armor. He found out that they had been made by the same manufacturer. The Earth Force sergeant had let him take a power loader for a test run. Rusty's power armor training and natural ability to disassemble and reassemble puzzles in any desired configurations made him a natural at logistics. He tried coping with his trauma in the usual ways, with little success. Overwork was pretty good, except you had to sleep eventually and nightmares came. Intoxicating substances made him sick. Women quickly noticed that he was dead inside, so they would start avoiding him. He tried extreme sports, but got annoyed by arrogant punks who thought that these juvenile stunts made them apex predators and warriors. He lost all zeal for the Templars. The thought of going to services or participating in rituals was a heavy burden. It was a relief when he just simply stopped. Out of desperation, he had even tried using military mental health services. Still nothing. It seemed like they just wanted to endlessly regurgitate his story, then toss him handfuls of pills and piffy slogans and declare him cured. Rusty was really starting to hate people. Then he went on leave and took an alien transport. Everything was weird. There was almost nothing familiar. The people were all sorts of creatures with different cultures and societies. The art, music, food... Entertainment, even furniture, were so different that Rusty didn't have time to think about the past. Leave on Earth had been a nightmare, again constant reminders of Blood River. But when he took another alien transport back to his unit, he found the distractions again. That's when he made up his mind. When he arrived back at his unit, he put in a request for an immediate transfer to an Earth Force Logistics Command. His commanding officer had refused the transfer, but agreed to let him work with the local logistics unit. The unit's efficiency increased dramatically, partially from having a talented workaholic in Rusty, and partially from having a battle-hardened veteran like Rusty, who could intimidate the laziest malcontent with a stare. At one point, Rusty had an unexpected visitor. Colonel Ibanez was bringing in reinforcements to the local peacekeeping garrison, which was propaganda verbiage for suppressing local insurgents who didn't cooperate with the puppet government EarthGov had instituted. 
he had gotten a message that the colonel wanted to meet with him in the chapel right after lunch. Rusty walked in apprehensively. He saw the colonel kneeling and praying before the altar. Rusty sat down in a pew. After a few minutes, Ibanez finished his prayer and sat down in the same pew as Rusty. Rusty noticed that he was wearing a simple Templar's robe, free of any markings of rank or status. Ibanez noticed that Rusty was wearing just a basic Marine uniform instead of a Templar robe. Maury spoke. It is good to see you again, Hauser. Your commanding officer asked me to speak to you. He says you are one of his finest Marines, and yet you wish to quit. I have also heard that you may withdraw from the Templars. Please, speak freely. We are brothers before God. Rusty breathed a sigh of relief. The colonel spoke to him quietly, not the forceful diatribe that he anticipated. Yes, sir. Ibanez held up a hand. Brother, poor favor continue. Rusty took a breath and gathered his thoughts. Yes, brother. I was at Blood River. I have never... I saw that place. Rusty suddenly felt overwhelmed and his voice died. Ibanez gently put a hand on his shoulder. I heard of Blood River. It has touched you, and now nothing is the same. Rusty nodded. I understand. This is why we do not promote initiates before their first battle. It changes a man, and some find that they cannot continue. Rusty felt shame. I swear I'm not a coward, it's just... Ibanez looked at him with understanding. A coward never would have done the things you did. A coward would have made poor decisions, then blamed others for his behavior. A coward would try to tell me what he thinks I want to hear. You are not a coward. Rusty said. Thank you. That's a relief. The worst part was thinking that I had let the Templars down. It's supposed to be a sacred brotherhood, but I just want to quit. I just can't think about doing that again. Ibarnez gave him a wistful smile. This is not uncommon. This is why the Templars wait. You bring no dishonor to the Order. Do you have your San Martin? Rusty nodded and pulled out his dog tag chain. There was an extra tag on it with an image of St. Martin and the Templar logo. Ibanez stood and grasped the tag. He spoke formally. Then I, as a Padre Superior in the Templars, release you from your vows. He released the tag and let it fall to Rusty's chest. You are in good standing with us. You are welcome to return if you wish. Rusty thanked him. Ibanez continued. I hear you only have a few months left of your enlistment. I will speak to your commanding officer to have you stay here. The last audit did not go favorably. I hear you keep order among the Space Force Cucarachas, so things are better. Esta bien. Rusty had finished his enlistment with the Terra Marines, working logistics and discovering aptitudes he didn't know he had. After his enlistment was up, he had gone home to Earth to live with his ailing grandfather. The tough old bastard still worked 12 hours a day on the farm. He suddenly dropped dead one day from a surprise heart attack in the middle of refurbishing a fence. Rusty, in his grief, had finished the fence because nothing irritated a farmer more than neglecting chores. Rusty sold the farm to a nice young homesteading family, then left Earth forever. That is how he came to the Nogala, a Denari ship. He had gotten work as a logistics specialist. Some aliens he made friends with, others not so much. Rusty was sitting on the floor of the passageway in the ship, doing his paced breathing, trying to ground back into his present reality from the flashback. That's when one of his alien friends found him. Perg was the most inoffensive creature the universe had ever created. His species name was completely unpronounceable, but most humans called them space otters due to the strong resemblance. Perg was the ship's information specialist, having an endless supply of data tablets with useful knowledge about any given topic. Perg was also... cute. He was furry with big eyes and stood slightly taller than Rusty's waist. Rusty constantly had to resist the urge to pet him, Perg came walk waddling over to Rusty. Oxidize, 
Why are you sitting here? Are you unwell or injured? Do you require the medical specialist? Rusty chuckled and shook his head. He had been on the ship for a few years now, and yet the aliens still all called him Oxidize. Sometimes he wondered if they did it just to screw with him. No, Perg, I'm okay. I'm just having a rough day. Perg pulled out a data tablet, tapped for a moment, read the result, then put it away. It seems you are experiencing emotional distress. Is that correct? Rusty nodded slightly and said, Yeah, but it's no big deal. I'll be okay. And he shifted so he could get up. Instead, Perg sat down next to him. Then I shall give consolation. I am not due on the bridge for some time. Rusty tried to shift again. Really, Perg, that's not necessary. I'd rather be alone. Perg shifted with Rusty, with the effect being like Perg was actually snuggling into him. His fur was thick and warm, so Rusty felt his resistance draining. Perg, no, come on, I sure, why not? Other crew members passed by them. The aliens took it in stride. The human was always doing something bizarre. Since it was just sitting there being supervised, there probably wasn't anything to worry about. As other otters passed by, Perg summoned them. Any who were off-duty joined in consoling Rusty. They were soft, warm, furry, and almost seemed to make a gentle, low, trilling noise. Rusty found himself drifting off to sleep. He dozed, having mild dreams of warm spring days and cool fall evenings. Otters came and went, and Rusty was vaguely aware of this. At one point, several hours later, he awoke, refreshed with only three otters cuddled to him and a couple of otter children and his cat, Peanut Butter, napping in his lap. Chut, the parent of the children and the ship's chronology specialist, was quietly reading. Chut spoke to Rusty in low tones. Ah, Oxidize, are you awake now? Do you still have emotional distress? We can continue giving consolation. Rusty gently moved the otter children to Chut's lap. Actually, I think I'm doing better now. That's the best sleep I've had in a very long time. Chuck bobbed his head happily. Excellent, I shall tell Perg. Rusty watched as Chuck Walk waddled away with the children. It was going to be a good day, and it was time to get to work.